Alrighty, g'day guys. Welcome back to another live where I'm going to go through some questions that I had regarding my latest flip deal that I've just sold last week in in uh, Palmelia. Um, I've sort of already did a bit of a video yesterday on it where I sort of covered stuff myself and some of the questions I've got are, are pretty similar to that. So I'll try not repeat myself too much. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll answer these questions I've got and I'll just really try and, um, yeah, just give you a bit more understanding of, of the deal and how it came about and, yeah, any learnings and that sort of thing. Um, so, look, first question I got was, and the majority of the questions are from one person, but that's okay. Um, I'm sure it's going to be useful for everyone. What was the situation around the seller? So the seller, in this case, they were... It was a an Asian couple, and they, well, I think the wife had a bit of a health issue, and they wanted to live closer to the a hospital that was sort of in a city. So they'd already moved into this uh, into an apartment close by, um, in I think it was in Subiaco. So those of you that know Perth, uh, there's a, a major hospital in Subiaco. So they were already sort of renting an apartment in, in Subiaco, and the house was obviously you know it was. Uh, vacant and it was pre obviously it was pretty run down you saw the pictures and stuff like that you know like i said there was you know rotten rotten you know timber and, and stuff like that so the, and the the general house the, the general um presentation of the house was was pretty run down so they just wanted a, an out um i'm also aware that they spoke to another property flipper so someone else that i uh, she know went and had a look at that property as well um but yeah at the end of the day they the, the seller just wanted a wanted to get out they didn't want to pay agents fees that was the reason why they called and yeah obviously like i said previously this home was owned uh, it was a shared equity home so it was partly owned by keystart so for people that don't know what that means in wa the keystart is like a government initiative where low-income earners can get access to Keystart loans, which means typically I think it's the Keystart loans like 40% and they own 60%. But what that means is when they sell it, obviously they only get you know 60% of the profit or whatever because the government gets their part. Um, but also when they go to sell it, Keystart, the government, they do their own valuation. And yeah, and so with their valuation, you know, they're not gonna let the seller sell it for under, under that. So in order for that, for that, Appraisal to have come back at two hundred ninety thousand, which was obviously low, and I recognise that straight away. Then it, it shows you what sort of condition the house was really in. So, but so yeah, so that was that question. Um, I had a quick question about around what did the renovation cost? So I've already mentioned this as well, and the cost was was fifty nine thousand. I, I forecasted for a fifty five thousand dollar renovation, so I had a bit of a blowout. I know I had so I had what four grand blow it, but I also had a contingency in there for five grand. So realistically, you could say my rental actually blew out nine k because, um, and and the reason for that that blowout was I've mentioned it already. Those windows was uh, an oversight from myself, so that was five thousand three hundred because those there was you know uh, three windows that were completely rotten, but one of them was a corner window, so it was really four windows, and then. There was other things, and I've mentioned this as well, but there was other things in the house that were just not normal, so that I don't normally have to fix. So normally when I do a house, I gut the inside, but typically the outside is normally okay, like things like gutters and fascia and stuff like that, whereas this one, you know, it needed complete gutter replacement both sides. Fortunately, there was only the style of home, there was only gutters down two sides, so not at the rear and not at the front, just because of the shape of the roof. So that needed completely replacing, and then... You know, with these older homes, I know a lot of them these days, it's more like the fascia is more, you know, metal or whatever, but a lot of the older homes, it's it's timber. So quite often you find that the, the end of the fascia or, or whatever can be rotten. It, you know, it splits and it starts, um, yeah, it starts rotting sort of thing. And that happens, obviously, if it's not if it's not maintained, not, you know, it's not painted. Obviously, the paint keeps timber, um, you know, it's, it's a, obviously it treats, the, treats it so it stops them from rotting. So when, when they get neglected and that's what happens over time so that that sort of stuff needed all replacing as well um also the painting was actually more than normal as well because yeah there was a, there was 
there was a lot more sanding back and a lot more work that the painters had to do as well. So that was another little bit of a blowout as well. So that's why, um, taking it into consideration, all that sort of stuff, that's that's why they the, had that little blowout. Um, what's your process from getting a deal to putting the deal to or putting a plan together and looking and locking in the trades and stuff like that. Okay, so with any any project that I secure, basically the first thing that I do is, you know, as soon as I secure the property, I normally allow myself at least thirty days for settlement. So the reason I want set, uh, at least thirty days is because I want to be able to start the renovation straight away, straight after. I settle. So the day after I settle, I want to be starting work because that way it minimizes my whole time. So in some cases, for example, you know, I, if I've got a couple of deals on the go, I'm, I know my, uh, my trades aren't going to be able to sort of do that. Then, you know, they're going to be sort of caught up. Then potentially what I'll do is I might, you know, you know, schedule the, the start date or schedule, have the settlement for, you know, 45 days or whenever. So I, I, I always set this uh, the settlement date so that way I can pretty much start the renovation straight away. I don't want to be in a situation where the house is sitting there for a week two or two just um, doing nothing. You know, I want work to start straight away. So I want to minimise my holding cost. But basically what my process is, is I, I organise a schedule straight away. So I'll go and I'll basically jot down, um, you know, from, you know, okay, so I settle on this day and then I just sort of schedule every trade in. So, you know, it starts with the disconnect. So for day one, plumber and the um, electrician will come in and do all the disconnect. So obviously that way a demo can happen. Um, and then obviously day one, you know, skip bin will arrive. So, and then day two, once the demo, once all the disconnects done, you know, I have my my demo guy, my, my handyman does all my demo. So he comes in and starts, you know, pulling out cabinets and all that sort of stuff, taking up floor coverings and stuff like that. If there's tile removal, I've got my tile removal guy who, you know rips up all the tiles and grinds it all back for me. So I schedule the tray that the the reno and that and because I, I do my reno so quick, you know, four to five weeks is a typical renovation for me. And look, depending on the the type of renovation that you're doing, if you were doing more higher end renos, more expensive and you you're doing, you know, more to it, then obviously you wouldn't be able to do the reno in four to five weeks. I, I, I can gut a house and put it back together in four to five weeks, but that's like a low end renovation. It's not a high end um you know, Reno. You know, if I was in it doing working in sort of more prestigious areas and stuff like that, yeah, you wouldn't be doing a Reno that quickly. But in the market that I play in, which is, you know, like I said, I, I'm quite open that I I choose more, you know, entry level suburbs. Um, those sorts of suburbs, you know, I can pretty much gut the house and have nothing in the house. So you know, rip up all cabinetry and rip, rip, completely rip out the house, and I'm just leave the the slab and the the walls. And I can, and the ceiling, obviously, and I can put it back together in you know four to five weeks. So that's um, schedule is really important. You, you need to all your trades need to know basically when they're due to come in. And once you've sort of got that relationship with your trades, then they will be, you know, they you know them really well. They know you really well. They score to sort of put your, um, you know, they, they'll prioritise your jobs over other jobs because you give them you know eight jobs or nine jobs a year or whatever it might be. Um, if I was only giving one or two a year, then obviously yeah, maybe you don't get that same, um, you know, preference, and you also probably wouldn't have the same relationship with them because you, you wouldn't not know them as well. But because I do so many renos, and you know, I've sort of built my team up over the last couple of years, I've you know certainly got rid of a few people along the way that let me down. But as, you know, as you build your team, and, and you, you know, you obviously get pretty close with them because you see them pretty pretty regularly and stuff like that. So. Um, I mean, my Renaults because it's like I'm so you know cookie cutter focused where you know everything's the same, same floor, same tap, where everything like that, same electrical. Like I don't even really need to go to the you know like I don't even worry about getting them to the site anymore. Like they just rock up and they just know what to do. So like my plumber, for example, at my Palmilia and my electrician, they're both doing disconnect this morning, but I'm here, so I couldn't get there. And I've also got a a um and I've got a whoops session with my mindset coach straight after this so i couldn't be down there for disconnect um this morning so um i just sent 
Nathan, my plumber, a message and just said, same as the other two, <laughs> like that you've just finished, you know, like because we've just finished it too. I said, just sa same as that, just send me the order through what I need to buy. So he'll just he'll just come back to me and he'll just send me a message and it'll be like, you know, this is what you need. He'll send me a, t a text message or a WhatsApp message, then I'll just ring up um, or email my contact at TradeLink, Lauren, and I'll just say, Lauren, this is what I need, and she'll just give me a quote for it, and I'll say I need it in the next few days, and I'll go down and pick it up. So you want to get your system so streamlined that it's like that. Um, you know, likewise with my, uh, my electrician. Electrician's actually a good mate of mine, um, like he's one of my best mates. So he is down there this morning as well, and... Um, you know, he knows what to do. He just, he'll just go around. I, you know, because it's like a cheaper entry level reno, I'm not doing things like down lights and stuff like that. I'm doing, I just do oyster lights. If I was, do, if it was more, you know, premium area, then I would obviously have to put in down lights, and obviously down lights cost more and take more time and stuff like that. But yeah, with the oyster lights, I just say to him, you know, just count up all the lights, and then I say to him, look, you know, obviously do the disconnect. Obviously, make sure that you know rip out the bathroom. So, well, I'm actually keeping the, the kitchen at this house um, because the kitchen's fine. So um, I might just replace the appliances. I think the cooktop's fine anyway, but um, but yeah, you know, you, you, you once you start using your trades so regularly and they just keep repeating um, the, you know, the same thing all the time, then it makes it really easy. You don't have to be on site all the time. Likewise, my handyman, like he spends probably you know, if a four or five week reno, he's on site for like at least two weeks of every reno. He's almost like my supervisor on site. And and, and I don't even have to tell him what I, what I want done. He just turns in and says, oh, Grant, this is done, this is broken, this is broken. I'm like, oh, yeah, just fix it. And that's just how it is. So and I, I have an allowance in there for my for my handyman. Like I know that he, my handyman's really good with flooring and stuff, so he lays all my hybrid floors and stuff. But then I also have a... Um, Sort of a budget in my always for, for about three grand or four grand, um, which I just have for him to be able to f do like odd bits and pieces. So he'll, you know, like, you know, like the gutters, for example, or like a, um, you know, anything that's broken, like, you know, like replacing timber, or if there's crap in the, you know, the site that just needs picked up and stuff like that, you know, it might, it might be a couple of days in that. I also have, you know, an allowance in there for him to do things like at the end where he goes around and puts together, you know, puts up mirrors and shower um, shower screens and he does, um, you know, handrails and towel rails and toilet roll holders and just all that sort of finishing stuff. So schedule is really, really important. Um, yeah, once once you've done lots of deals and you've got a pretty good team, it definitely makes it easier. Um, okay, next question. Did I budget for the reno? To at 500k so i've covered this one as well but so absolutely not like when i did my fees i did my fees on 450 and I've, I've said that in the previous video so i said up front that um there was sales evidence between 450 and 480 so i knew if i purchased it at, at um for as i purchased at 290 i knew that if i got my minimum sale price of 450 then i would have walked away with about 55k or something like that and for me, I don't normally like doing any deals under 60K. So that's the normal minimum. But I also knew that there was sales evidence of 480. So I was thinking, okay, 450, you know, it could be 480. But worst case, it's going to be 450. So I'm thinking, worst case, I was going to make 55K profit from that deal. It was on a bit of a thoroughfare. So in my mind as well, I was like, okay, it's on a thoroughfare. So maybe I can't expect the 480. So, But I can definitely expect at least the, the lower end of that, which is 450. But then I also knew that it was a growth in a growth market. So Parmelio is, is a suburb that's performing really well. A lot of interstate investment driving up the prices. So in my in my mind, I was like, you know, from so from day dot, I wanted to achieve at least, um, yeah, I was wanting to, you know, the the price bracket was four fifty to four eighty. I was wanting to um, achieve closer to four eighty. But at the same time, then I thought, well, I also knew there was going to be growth because, you know, I know what part, I, I look at the data and I know which suburbs in Perth are, are performing the best. So it's all, it's strategic, yeah? Like this is the stuff that I'm sort of teaching um, some coaching clients now that I've sort of taken on is that, you know, you've got to be strategic in the areas that you look at. I mean, in some cases you can't be because, you know, if it's, you know, if the market that you're in is just simply, you know, there's not in a growth phase and 
then that's what it is what it is. But Perth at the moment, like I know that the, the suburbs that have been achieving or doing the best over the last 12 months have been the lower end suburbs. Suburbs that are more middle market or higher end haven't had the same growth that the lower end suburbs have had in Perth. So why would I be playing in that sort of seven, eight hundred price bracket, nine hundred, um, when the price, the properties in the you know the you know three hundred to six hundred are the ones that are performing the best. And the reason they're the performing that will have been performing the best is because what's been driving the market in Perth has been interstate investors, not owner occupiers. And so, what do the interstate investors want? They want high rental yields. So that's they can't get that same six or seven percent rental yields in those more expensive parts of town. So, which that's going to change in Perth. Um, I absolutely know that in the sort of you know next year and the year after, you know. The lower end part of Perth, you know, the cheaper market will will have, you know, will will peak sort of thing, and it's and you know then that middle market and the the higher market. I mean, don't get me wrong, the middle market's already having growth as well, but it just hasn't had the same, you know, activity because with interest rate rises and stuff like that, a lot of the owner occupiers have sort of, you know, don't get me wrong, because there's low stock levels, everything's been selling quickly anyway, but there hasn't been the same amount of activity in that middle market or higher end market in because it's been owner occupied driven it's, what's really been driving perth has been the fact that it was you know strong rent to was one of the cheapest medians in the country um you know a lot of interstate investment because you know sydney melbourne that um yeah it they couldn't buy you know positive cash flow profits and stuff, stuff like that that you could get in perth so that's really what's been driving perth so that's why i've been selective in those in you know in in renovating in those markets so but if i let's say for example perth wasn't in a growth phase when i do my renovations i do my numbers based on what it would get today so you know the deal that i just did in palmelia the one i just you know over achieved 115,000 profit let's say it wasn't in a growth phase let's say it was just a neutral market the sales evidence was 450 to 480 so i knew even if i sold it at the 450 mark then I would have made 55k, so potentially up to 85k. So my price, you know, my price, my growth, sorry, my price um, profit would have been based on what the numbers were, would have been 55 to 85k. However, the reason I got 115 is because I rode that extra, that extra growth. If that makes sense, is that right? No. 55 anyway whatever it is so but i know that the reason i got the extra was purely because because i got you know, i rode some growth whereas even if the even if the market was completely neutral i still would have got a certain amount of i still would have got in my price range between 450 and 480 which would have been a still a healthy profit anyway um so yeah so that's that's pretty much answers all the questions i think um i've sort of covered everything off on that deal in the other video anyway so i won't go too much more into it um keep it short and sweet but yeah that's um yeah i'll, I'll share a couple more videos on this property I'll, I'll do some i'll share some stuff on the on the kitchen breakdown show you sort of you know how much money i spent on a kitchen renovation also spent plan on sending showing one on the feasibility show showing where the money was actually spent also plan on um, doing another video on the bathroom so I can show you, you know, how much money I'm spending on a bathroom renovation and stuff like that. But keep in mind, just because that's what I'm doing in Perth, for example, that, you know, you know, like, for example, if I was, let's say I spend, you know, 50K, 60K, 70K on a renovation in Perth in, in the suburbs I'm working, if I was working in a different market, then that renovation would cost, you know, a different amount because it requires, you know, different fittings and fixtures and stuff like that. So I, what I'm trying to get at is that, and we talk. I talk about being an area expert and stuff like that. Once you know what your market is and you know what your buyer wants, then you can work out what a renovation is going to cost in the market that you're trying to do renos in. So, but anyway, that's probably a video for another day. So thank you for listening and um, yeah, I'll leave you to it.